For your Bibles this morning, I want to invite you to turn to Mark chapter 8. Thank you, praise team. What a wonderful song. What a wonderful uh, way to worship the Lord today. And we, we really appreciate all of our musicians and singers. They really are uh, committed to doing a wonderful job every week, and we so appreciate that. Uh, this morning, I want to preach to you about a commitment that alleviates fear. A commitment that alleviates fear. It's in Mark chapter 8, and I want to begin reading in verse 31 and read down through verse 38. Mark's gospel, chapter 8, beginning in verse 31. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he was stating the matter plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Turning around and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you're not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. And he summoned the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This morning I want to speak to you about a commitment that alleviates fear. You know, fear is a great motivator. It moves us. It causes us to act. And sometimes uh, those who uh, uh, study human nature tell us that fear is the very first emotion that we experience as human beings. I know that uh, we're afraid of many things. I would be dishonest if I was to stand here and say, I'm never afraid and nothing scares me. As a matter of fact, a lot of things uh, I'm afraid of, uh, and I won't even go into all of them. But uh, some people are afraid of the dark. Many people are terrified of needles. Uh, I didn't know how many, a great percentage of people just break out into a sweat. They know they've got to get a shot or... or uh, uh, give blood, and, and it's, a, it's a fear that people have. Some people are afraid of dogs. Uh, I'm afraid of dogs if they look mean. Uh, some people are afraid of cats. I'm not really afraid of them, but nonetheless, uh, 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 a lot of people are afraid of heights. I don't like heights. Some people are, 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 are petrified of storms. When a storm comes, they get afraid. And so anything just about that you uh, can name, somebody is afraid of it. And, uh, you know, you don't get to pick what you're afraid of. A lot of things just cause you to be afraid. I suppose some of the greatest fears that people experience, uh, number one would be the fear of dying. People don't want to die. I'd say a second great fear is the fear of losing everything, just totally losing everything. It's a huge fear. And then I think the third fear that we all have, we all share in common, is the fear of being condemned eternally, being an eternal loss after you live this life, go off into a state of condemnation. This morning I want to preach about and uh, explain how this commitment that Jesus called his disciples to alleviates our fears. And the central truth of this message is being fully devoted to Christ alleviates our deepest fears. Now, let me set the context here for Mark chapter 8. Mark's gospel is very fast-paced. Uh, one of the most prominent used words in Mark's gospel is the word immediately or immediate. 
He starts off, I think, in chapter 1 of Mark's gospel. It's used four times, immediately, immediately. And Mark is like in a hurry. Uh, he's wanting to start with the, with the ministry of John the Baptist. Mark, don't, don't tell us about the birth of Jesus and all that stuff. He starts with John the Baptist, and then he goes straight to the cross. Uh, about half his book is about the life of Jesus, and about half of it is the last week of Jesus. And so he's in a hurry. He's fast-paced. And in chapter 8, it's just like machine gun fashion. Boom, boom, boom. Things are happening in Mark 8. Let me just give you an overview very quickly. In Mark chapter 8, it starts off with Jesus feeding 4,000 people with seven loaves and two fish. And then immediately following that, the Pharisees approach Jesus and they demand a sign that he is the Messiah, which actually is funny if you think about it because one of the Messianic signs was to bring bread from heaven like Moses did. And Jesus had just fed 4,000 people with a, a couple of loaves of bread and some fish. And so, uh, and then, then Jesus healed a blind man immediately following that. And the only person in Scripture that healed blindness was Jesus. And that was also a Messianic sign. It was a sign of the coming Christ. And so then Peter, uh, seeing all these wonderful Messianic signs, he declares that Jesus is the Christ. He makes it public. He says it. And so I think the point here is, is, is Mark is leading up to something, and he talks about the multitude that's following Jesus. By this time, the crowd was electrified. They were looking for the coming of the Son of Man, or they were expecting a David-like king to come and get rid of all their oppressors and to kick out the uh, Gentiles and restore the temple and, and, and get rid of the Romans. And, and they desperately longed for liberation because of the oppression of the Roman government over their lives. And so by this point, seeing all these miracles that Jesus is doing, they are ready to storm the gates of Jerusalem and crown him king. And so this is kind of the atmosphere that leads up to this passage that I'm talking about. And all of a sudden, in the atmosphere of all of this uh, excitement, Jesus stops the bus. And he says, y'all got to get something straight here. He puts on the brakes, and in verse 30, Jesus says, don't tell anybody about me. Don't go spreading it around. Now, why would he say that? Well, this passage of Scripture, I want you to see, contradicts two of the most popular teachings of our day. It, it contradicts, uh, he, in verse 34, he called the crowd to him and he said to them, if anybody wants to follow me, he's got to first deny himself, take up the cross and follow me. Now, Jesus tells Peter, keep this quiet. You know who I am, but that's, that's, you're missing the point, Peter. Why did Jesus want him to tone it down? Here's why. Because Jesus did not come to start a social revolution. Jesus Christ and Christianity is not a social revolution. Peter, we're not going to Jerusalem to overthrow the kingdom. Jesus Christ did not come to reform society. I want to say that again. He's leaving. Y'all look this way. Jesus did not come to reform society. Jesus came to redeem individuals. And Jesus, I know this might be hard to swallow, but Jesus was and is not a Democrat. Jesus was and is not a Republican. Jesus was and is not a liberal. Jesus was not and is not a conservative. In fact, if those groups are anything, they need to get on the bus with Jesus and not get Jesus on the bus with them. And Jesus was not gathering a protest group to march on Jerusalem and then on to Rome. 
And don't understand what I'm saying. I'm not saying that Christians are not uh, to get involved in, in social issues. I'm not saying that we as Christians ought to stick our head in the sand and pretend that there's nothing wrong. We are called to be salt and light. We are called to influence our community. But the point I'm trying to make this morning is that Christianity transcends politics. Politics, for the most part, is about uh, controlling Gaining power, ruling over others, controlling people and money. Jesus came to save people from eternal destruction and to restore them to the right place and a right relationship with God the Father. And Jesus came to change the hearts of those who are willing to repent and turn to him. And so uh, Jesus stopped the train here. Jesus stopped the bus. Jesus stopped the parade and he said, listen, well, this is not a social revolution. you got to get that straight. Another thing Jesus cleared up in this passage is, and this is one of the most popular teachings, Jesus directly refutes in this passage the prosperity gospel. The prosperity gospel basically teaches that God intends for his followers to be healthy, wealthy, and prosperous, and full of success. And those followers, this is the prosperity gospel, that those who follow Christ, who do the right thing, that's always thrown in there, those people who follow Christ and do the right thing, the right thing usually has something to do with giving a donation to whoever's preaching his ministry. Uh, those who do the right thing, say the right words, use the right incantations, and release their faith the right way, God will make them prosperous, God will make them healthy, God will make them happy. Whatever their heart's desire is, God's just sitting on the throne waiting for us to get it right so he can give it to us. And Jesus said in verse 34, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, and take up his cross and follow me. With that statement, Jesus debunked much of what you hear preached on modern-day television. Jesus tells us that those who truly want to be his disciples, those who truly deny themselves and take up the cross and follow him are not apt to receive their best life now. But instead... A cross. And Jesus Christ can and will never be manipulated by clever marketing schemes. He'll not be used as a prop for a political campaign. And he's not trying to win a popularity contest. Christ's followers do not receive inside tips on how to get popular and win influence, escape trouble, and live a life avoid, uh, without difficulties. So Jesus stopped the parade to straighten out those misconceptions. Then he challenges us with a truth. And that's what I want you to see is two things. First, the truth and how it alleviates our fears. The truth is in Jesus' sermon in verse 34 and 35. He said there, he called, if anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake in the Gospels will save it. Following Jesus requires self-denial. Following Jesus requires self-denial. Notice he says, and it applies to everyone. He says, if anyone... This is not a truth. These verses are not a truth for extra special Christians. This is not an extra credit uh, thing that Jesus said. This is primary, basic, fundamental Christianity. This, you got to die to yourself. Now, people struggle with that. I remember going to a Baptist church many years ago. I wasn't a pastor. As a matter of fact, I probably hadn't preached more than three times in my whole life. And the, the, there was a little church in the country over in Tennessee, didn't have a preacher that Sunday, and they didn't know have anybody else. They scraped the bottom of the barrel and called me. And so I showed up, and, and uh, I sat in a men's Sunday school class, and it was on this passage. I'll never forget it. And the teacher said, 
to everybody, about 30 grown men, most of them above 60 years old, and uh, ask the question, has it ever cost you anything to follow Jesus? And they all, one after another, went around the room and said, no, I don't think it ever has. I don't think it's ever cost me anything. I can't remember giving up anything for Jesus. And I think after I've reflected on that many times, I think the problem there was is they were missing the point. The point is not that we get rid of all of our material possessions per se. It's not that we uh, uh, live the life of the Buddha. You know, the Buddha, the, the legend about the Buddha was he, he, he starved himself. He fasted trying to find God until he got so skinny he could touch his spine from the front of his stomach. I mean, that's really excessive. That's, that's really denying yourself uh, those kinds of things. But that's really not the idea of what Jesus is saying. I think Jesus means that we are to deny ourselves, meaning we are to deny or live or die to our selfish living. Stop being selfish. It may mean more, but it at least means that we abandon the notion that we are at the center of our own universe. We give up our life. We die to self, and we allow him to give us a new life. I thought about this. I remember back after, you know, we've seen a lot about 9-11 and the Twin Towers, and we've watched that again, that horrific scene unfolding again and I remember shortly after that there was an NFL player his name was Pat Tillman remember Pat Tillman Pat Tillman was an NFL star and he just immediately abandoned that life Pat Tillman all his life wanted to be a professional football player but when uh, the, 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 the United States was under attack he gave up his life and went to become an army ranger And y'all know the story of Pat Tillman. He died on the battlefield. But I'm here to tell you, Pat Tillman gave up his life long before he ever died on the battlefield. He gave up his life for the life he had for something much better, a calling much higher. Pat Tillman exemplifies what we're saying here. I remember... This morning, as a matter of fact, I was on the way to church, and I always like to listen to a radio program. It's called uh, Understanding the Times Radio. Just this morning, the the guest they had on there was a woman uh, who gave a testimony, and uh, she has a website. It's called Transgendered or Transformed. You might want to check out that website. But she goes on, and this, this verse is her life's verse. And what she said was, is when Jesus Christ came into her life, she had already started the surgical procedures to change herself from a woman to a man. But Lord Jesus Christ would not let her go, and he converted her heart and changed her life. And now she's a beautiful woman, and now she's living her life according to God. And she said, I had to give up that life, and once I did, I allowed God to define me, and now I am happy. Now she's truly living. And it may mean that God wants us to give up our careers, our goals, our money, our hobbies, our activities, our goals, our dreams. But it may not mean that at all. It may mean that God wants us to use our vocation, use the blessings that he's given us under his lordship to use that stuff to glorify him and to spread his name far and wide. The truth is, as long as we keep on trying to save our own lives, we're actually losing them. As long as we hoard and worry over and manage our careers and our talents and our goals and our dreams and our ambitions, all to gratify ourselves, in the long run, we lose them. But if we forfeit all that and give it up to the glory of God, we save our souls, our lives. This materialistic age we live in reminds me of a poem. I've, I've read this so many times, and it's, I don't know, I'm just different, I guess. This is my favorite poem. It's called uh, Richard Corey. I, some of y'all may have read Richard Corey. It's by Edwin Arlington Robinson. Whenever Richard... Corey went downtown. We people on the pavement looked at him. He was a gentleman from soul to crown, clean favored and imperially slim. 
And he was always quite arrayed. And he was always human when he talked. But still he fluttered pulses when he said, Good morning. And he glittered when he walked. And he was rich, yes, richer than a king. And admirably schooled in every grace. In fine, we thought that he was everything to make us wish that we were in his place. So on we worked and waited for the light and went without meat and cursed the bread. And Richard Corey, one calm summer night, went home and put a bullet in his head. You didn't expect that, did you? You see, living for self is the best way to lose yourself. Let me ask you a question. How long do you expect to live? You say, well, Pastor, I don't know. I hope it's a long time. What's a long time to you, 70, 75, 80, 85? How about 100? Would you like to live to be 100 years old? The closer I get to 100, the more it looks good. Well, let's just suppose you live to be 100. And during your 100 years, you actually do gratify your desires. You work hard. You accomplish your goals. You, you, you reach your dreams. You, 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 you get the American dream. You have a nice house. You got a nice car. Every year you get to go on fun vacations and, and, and all the rest. You get it all. And you live healthy. And then one day, like everybody else, you die. What do you have? What do you have? I'm here to tell you, if that's your life, you are going into eternity flat broke. Because what have you gained if you gain the whole world and forfeit your soul? But then I want you to consider a lady that I once knew and uh, actually attended her funeral. She never owned her own house. Her name was Miss Lacey. Miss Lacey was one of them shouting Baptists. Uh, you know, we kind of lost that. But uh, she did, man. When she got happy, she just let her rip. And, and she would squeal and carry on. And she loved the Lord. And, and uh, way back, right after the Depression, she heard the church was in a building program and they needed money to buy lumber. And her and her husband had a big pile of lumber that they had been uh, drying out so that they could build their dream home. And she knew that God wanted her to donate that lumber to the building program. As a result of that, she donated, her and her husband gave all that lumber, and they never owned a home after that point. And I knew her when she was just on her deathbed. And, and, and I got a call from the hospital and they said, Miss Lacey died this morning. And I went over to the hospital and they told me the circumstances around her death. She had two daughters and a son. And she lay there about 3 a.m. in the morning and grabbed her, the hands of her, two, her, her three children. And they sang, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And then she closed her eyes and she slipped off into eternity. And I'm here to tell you, she didn't have a mansion down here, but she's got one in glory. Hallelujah. Praise God. Beloved, the truth is, the truth is, we, we can gain the world at the expense of our soul or we can give up the world and save our soul. But we can't do both. The truth is that Christ is calling us to give up selfish living, to deny ourselves, even if it costs us our physical life and follow him. And by turning our lives completely over to Christ, we're actually saving our souls, saving our lives. And so how does this devotion, how does this commitment alleviate fear? Well, briefly, let me just give you one or two things. That's the application part. Number one, being fully devoted to Christ alleviates the fear of death. It alleviates the fear of death. According to psychologists, our greatest felt need, number one, is food, clothing, and shelter. 
And then very close to that, once you get food, once you get clothing, once you get shelter, the next thing is safety, personal safety. We want to feel secure. We don't want to die. We want to, we, we want to feel safe. And, you know, I've often said this before, and uh, it sounds kind of strange, but I really don't mind being physically dead. I just don't like the process of getting there, <laughs> you know. And I, and, and I know that we're all that away. Listen, I know where I'm going when I die. I know that, that Jesus has a home prepared for me in glory. But there's just something about the body that just wants to keep living. I, I, we, Cindy and I just last year saw both her parents died. And, and, and Cindy's mother used to read books on heaven. She had talked about dying from 70 to 95. I'm telling you, she was ready. If anybody was ever ready, she was. The godliest woman I've ever known. And yet on her deathbed, when she lay there, she could not turn her heart off. Her mind stopped. Her voice stopped. Her eyes grew dim. Her body just lay there. But that heart just kept on, kept on, kept on. And that's because physically we don't want to die. It goes against us. And yet, even in that state, she was not afraid to die. I, I saw a man one time come uh, to church and, I went over to visit him. When I went to visit him, uh, he, he, he was kind of embarrassed because he was doing something he was ashamed of when I pulled up. And, and uh, I went in to talk to him. I said, won't you come to, uh, to church? He told me, he said, if I ever come to your church, the ceiling will fall in. I said, man, I want to watch that. Won't you come next week? And uh, uh, he did come, and, 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 and he come two or three times. And I went back to his house one night and went in, and we sat there, and I thoroughly explained the gospel to him. He was very attentive. I told him that Jesus died on the cross for his sins and that if he would repent of his sins and turn to Jesus Christ as his Savior and Lord, he could have eternal life. And I said, would you like to receive Christ as your Savior? And that man and his wife and his little boy, all three, got on their knees in that little bitty living room and held hands, and we prayed and they received Christ as their Savior and Lord. And he was a big man. I'll never forget him. And about two months later, he grabbed me one day after church and he hugged me up real close and he said, I want to tell you something, preacher. He said, before, before I received Christ as my Savior, he said, I used to cry myself to sleep at night because I was so afraid of what was going to happen to me when I died. And now that I've given my life and my soul to the Lord Jesus Christ, I sleep like a baby because I know where I'm going. Praise God. Listen, turning your life over to Jesus is the best thing you can ever do. And I'm here to tell you, Steve, Steve's not afraid to die because back in 1981, Steve died. And old brother Boyd took Steve, old dead Steve, and put him in a watery grave of baptism. And up from the grave he arose with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm not afraid to pass from this world and be in the next, not because of anything Steve's done or any merit I've done or anything uh, worthy of, of heaven that I've done. I owe it all to the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did for me on the cross. And praise God, he said, it is finished. Hallelujah. What I'm talking about is assurance. I'm talking about knowing for certain that I am going to heaven. Why? Because when you give your heart to Jesus, when you give your life to Christ, he gives you eternal life in return. Now, you're not going to get this kind of assurance with a phony, baloney, half-hearted commitment. You've got to give yourself. You've got to give your soul. You've got to give your life to Christ and be done with it. Have you done that? Have you done that? The second thing, being fully devoted to Christ alleviates our fear of loss. A fear of loss. One of the greatest fears we have is losing everything. And, and it causes us to want to hold tight, almost be stingy, and to not be a giver. Notice what Jesus said in verse 36. What does it profit a man if he gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? As I said, we live in a materialistic age. People think they can purchase happiness. So, the media has done such a job on us. We've been programmed to think that the next thing will do it for us. The next new car, the next achievement, the next degree, the next wife, the next husband, the next this, the next house, the next this. It's just, it's just the next thing. If you just get that. 
and it never fulfills us. And more stuff often creates more heartache. Studies have shown that on a percentage basis, this is amazing, but on a percentage basis, the poorest among us are the most generous. Isn't that amazing? Isn't it sad to watch someone who has it all and everything to live for, according to this world, to lose it all? I once knew a wealthy man. And I'll tell you how wealthy he was. Now, y'all going to have to listen to me on this because I'm going to tell you a Tennessee saying that I'm probably going to have to explain to you because I know you won't get it. This man was so wealthy, we had a retired preacher in our church that knew about him, and he used to comment about him. He said, he is so wealthy, he's got so much money, he could burn a wet mule. <laughs> Y'all didn't get it. I knew you wouldn't. You think about a wet mule. How hard would it be to burn up a wet mule? You got to build a big fire to burn a wet mule. And this guy had so much money, he could burn a wet mule with his money. It's funny at home. <laughs> but the man was the man was so wealthy. But he was so afraid of losing it all. And he was so afraid of losing it that he run his wife off and she actually divorced him. And he had one only son and his only son despised him. And it just reminds me of this verse. What does it profit a man if he has the whole world and loses his life, loses his soul, loses his personhood, loses everything he is meant to be? He became a miserable, pathetic old man sitting among all his treasures. And he, like everyone else, is, is going to die. And then who's going to have all that stuff? You see, a better way is to give your soul and everything you have to Jesus. Dedicate it all to Jesus. Because Jesus has treasures reserved in heaven that you and I can't even imagine. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 19, Don't store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jim Elliott, missionary pilot, jungle pilot to South America, he went to South America to minister to people. Elliot was warned repeatedly that if he went, he may not come back. He went there to minister to the Aka Indians. And of course, when he got there, many of y'all know the story, Jim Elliot was speared to death by the very people he went there to minister to. Before he left to go on that mission, this is what he said. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Isn't that amazing? Here's a man who gave up his life way before he was ever killed. He forfeited his life for Jesus. And hey, if you want to see something wonderful, just check out the movie, The End of the Spear, and you'll see the second half of what happened. After he died, many of those Aka Indians came to follow Jesus Christ and changed their ways, and now Jim Elliott lives in heaven along with some of the people who he went to reach for Christ. And you see, that's what Jesus is calling us to do. He's calling us to stop living selfishly. And to start living for the kingdom of God. And then finally, being fully devoted to Christ alleviates the fear of the judgment. The idea of eternal damnation is a biblical teaching. Honestly, you know, if I could, I'd take it out of the Bible because I don't like it. I mean, who does, right? It's not something I like to talk about. But I would be shirking my duty as a minister of God if I didn't say what the Bible says. 
This, 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 this idea of, of, of judgment is a teaching that's fallen out of favor among many evangelicals. Preachers, I know, refuse to preach on the subject of punishment. They believe the subject of hell and eternal damnation is just too negative. They say it turns away crowds, and they, the people come to hear a positive message. But did you ever stop to think that the good news is good news because first, there's some bad news? Think about that. People appreciate the grace of God once they realize their spiritual condemnation. The Scripture puts them both together in verses. Listen to this. Here, here you go. Isaiah 53, 6. For all of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. Now, that's the bad news. We've all gone astray. We've all wandered away from God. We've all done wrong. That's the bad news. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. That's Jesus. That's the good news. Listen, I'll give it to you in a New Testament verse. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. Point blank, without qualification, there it is. That's the bad news. The wages of sin is death. And it'd be horrible if God just left it like that. But he follows that verse by saying, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Hallelujah, that's the good news, amen. Jesus spoke to the crowds that day. Jesus knew they were ambitious for all the wrong things. He wanted them to clearly understand that he was not a reformer, that he was not a means for them to get wealth and power and influence. He come to redeem them and to save them from their sin. But the way Jesus saves people is when they give themselves to him. Notice how he finished that statement, the last verse. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The Lord Jesus is going to come, and there is a judgment. There is a judgment. But those who have turned their lives completely over to Jesus have no reason to fear condemnation. Let me just close by sharing a story I was reading uh, not long ago. It was about the great preacher of the past named Charles Finney. Some of y'all have read about Charles Finney. Charles Finney uh, preached all over the Northeast and, and was a very powerful preacher. Uh, he once noticed while he was preaching in a crusade that there was a, 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 a man standing at the back door, barely inside the church. The door was closed behind him. He was leaning on the door. And Finney began to preach. And uh, the subject of Finney's sermon was the terrible judgment of God. And Finney preached hard trying to warn his listeners to flee the coming wrath. And then it came time to offer those in the congregation the opportunity to come to Christ to escape that wrath and to receive the good news through Christ and God's offer of complete and full pardon. And Finney gave the invitation, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And when he was given the invitation, he noticed that man, instead of coming forward, he bolted out the back door, terrified. And so Finney did something that I've never had the courage to do. He jumped off the pulpit and went after the guy. Out, out into the dark of the street, and he saw him turning the corner, and Finney was faster than he was, and he began to catch up with the man, and the man ran into an old, old boarding house, and up a winding staircase he went, and Charles Finney was right on his tail, and, and when Finney got into the room, he had his Bible open, but the guy rolled across an old bed, and he come up with a pistol, and he pointed it right at Finney. He said, preacher, get out of here, I'm going to kill you. And Finney said, the word of God says in John, 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And, and that, that, that old guy said to Finney, he said, Preacher, you don't understand. I'm a drunkard, I'm a gambler, I'm a fornicator. 
and God hates me. Then he says, but the word of God says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. He said, preacher, you don't understand what I've done. He said, the other night I came home in a drunken stupor and my little girl came up to me and she grabbed my leg and she hugged me and she said, daddy. And he said, like a fool, I flung her off. And when I did, she rolled down that staircase and she rolled her face right up against a red hot stove and it's disfigured her for life. God don't love me. Then he says, but the word of God says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Then he said, it's like time froze. And the man sat there and he said, but preacher, if anybody deserves to go to hell, I do. He said, yes, sir. But the word of God says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And according to Charles Finney, that man crumbled on the floor and in bitter tears, he gave his heart, he gave his life to the Lord Jesus. And the Lord Jesus flooded into his life and gave him a new heart and a new soul, and a new life. And according to, according to Finney, that man followed Jesus and was one of the most devoted followers of Christ the rest of his life. And I just want to ask you this morning. You see, Jesus gives two options in this passage. One is you can either live for yourself. You can live selfishly. But if you do, and if we do, we live for ourselves. If we live for ourselves, then we die to ourselves. Or we can die to ourselves, stop living selfishly, and start living for Christ. Turn our lives over to the Lord Jesus Christ, and once we do, we receive eternal life as a gift from God the Father. The first option creates fear. It creates the fear of death, the fear of losing, and the fear of judgment. But if we can choose Jesus, if we will choose Jesus, if whosoever chooses Jesus, Jesus promises eternal life, treasures in eternity without the fear of eternal judgment. I don't know about you, but I choose Jesus. Amen. I want to ask you this morning, you who are sitting here, have you truly committed your life to the Lord Jesus Christ? You say, well, I've been baptized. I was raised in church. But see, that's not the question. It's not the question. The question is, have you truly committed yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ? You say, yes, I have. Well, if you're a Christian, I want to ask one more question. You see, many Christian people have trusted Jesus Christ to forgive their past. But are you entrusting your present to the Lord Jesus Christ? See, that's a big difference. Are you entrusting your present to the Lord Jesus Christ? Because you see, if he's calling the shots and when he's calling the shots in our life, we don't have to fear all this stuff that's going around. We don't have to fear it. Hey, listen, I don't want to get COVID. I don't want it. I don't want anybody I know to get it. It's a bad disease. But I'm here to tell you, if I die of it tomorrow, I'm not afraid of it. I'm not afraid because I know where I'm going because Jesus died for my sins. I'm not afraid. I don't want to lose anything. I want to keep what I've earned. I want, I want to live a good life. But I'm here to tell you, if I lost it all today, I can't lose what's most precious because that's laid up in store for me in glory. What about you? Christians, are you entrusting your present to the Lord Jesus Christ? I want to ask you to all stand with me. Stand with me with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to read these verses again to you. I want you to meditate on them. I want you to hear Jesus say these words. If anyone wishes to come after me, 
He must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. As we go to the Lord in prayer, have you trusted Jesus? Have you given your life to Jesus? And then Christian people, are you entrusting your present to Jesus? Father, I call upon you today in the name of Jesus. I'm I'm so burdened right now for anyone who's listening who's not saved, who's not fully devoted to Christ. I pray today, Lord, you would grant them repentance and eternal life through Jesus Christ and that you would uh, help them to be bold and not ashamed of the Lord Jesus but to confess him today as Lord and Savior but Lord I'm also burdened for all of us myself and all of us included to trust you with our present that we may live free of fear knowing that God is in control And that Jesus has our life securely in his hand. And Father, give us the grace to respond according as you would like for us to. For it's in Jesus' holy name I pray. Amen.